especially to the hospital at Vancouver General. And then as I arrived there on the gurney, you know, I was lying down, covered up next to Sylvia. This is in the hospital. I had an experience of out of body. And I began to see that the doctors there and the nurses and the and everybody there was was um, it's as if they were totally exposed in their life. For example, I would look at a person and I would know everything about them, how they think, how they feel, how they are in their family, their belief system, everything I knew. And then I would go to another person, maybe a doctor, and I would again see the picture so clearly, everything that they felt and believed was totally open. Anyway, it went on and on from one person to another. But the thing to be very clear here is that I was in a state out of body and I'm sure that some of you have had experience of it. And in that state, you don't live in time and space. So therefore, when I was seeing one person and then another and then another, this is because I need to explain a sequential order of how it happened. But the sequential order did not happen in truth. What happened in truth is that I was them. But at the same time, I was still experiencing. And that was my first experience of oneness. <clears throat> then I knew that at that point that we are all interrelated, interconnected, interdependent. Um, after that, I... Um, came back, no, sorry, no, um, there was a, a light that appeared and I find myself <laughs> totally pulled into this light. And this light actually had a voice and it talked to me and it said, don't do anything. Don't follow anything at all right now. And in five days you'll be healed. But I believed it completely. So, I came to the body, I entered the body, I was pulled into it. Some people have asked me, was it your choice? Well, I don't know whether I wanted to be back or not, but the point was that I just happened to move back into the body, but I wasn't very happy feeling the pain again, the discomfort, the, um, the illness that I was in. Anyway, uh, to make a long story short, there were uh, about six doctors to see me and they couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. And then I ad ad admitted to one of the doctors that I saw spirit and I saw the light and I talked to the light. And at that point, this was 2007, so, <laughs> Uh, he thought there was something wrong with me. <laughs> so they put me in a room where there were no windows. It was kind of dark. Maybe they thought I was going out of my mind. And they consulted with other doctors to know what, what to do with this guy. We can't understand what is happening with him. But um, at this point, my wife, uh, Sylvia, she, um, she had to stay in that room, which was cold and dark and there was nothing, but she slept on the floor just so that she'll stay with me all the way through. Uh, her loyalty really touched me very deeply. Um, <clears throat> but after that, they took me away to be tested. They came back with no results. Anyway, um, she uh, attended me every day. She brought me uh, fresh vegetables, organic fruit and, and um, vegetables. And uh, all I recovered after four days or so. And an Italian doctor came over to see me and he said, well, I guess you're going to leave us now. And he said, I'm surprised. I don't know what happened. But from now on, if people ask you, tell them that you've had a uh, um, blood poisoning. But blood poisoning, because <laughs> that would be a very good way to, to to explain something that was inexplicable. 
So, and then I went home. Three days later, I was riding the bicycle and I was perfectly normal. Now the question is, what was that experience, really? And I had often prayed that I do experience oneness. I do experience the, the truth of being, that I am a, a spirit and truth. I am not a body. We are not bodies. And so because I had prayed that before, it, I had that experience unexpectedly. And I feel that this is what actually happened. So then um, I realized that this is the most important knowledge that there is to know who you are. We, you know, we, people live in their bodies all day long. They really feel that this is who they are. They accept it and then they complain about the world. But I found things about the world that I didn't know that the world was like a, almost like a testing ground, like a school for us to learn. <clears throat> anyway, now the question arises, why did this happen? Why did we fall into separation from each other if we are really one? Why did this separation happen? And now, as, as it explained in, uh, I think it was one of the Bibles and also Course in Miracles, and the feelings that came to me is that there was a time where we lived in pure consciousness, pure awareness, but we were all joined as one. So in truth, no one was ever born or will ever die. We are totally eternal being. <clears throat> But something happened within the, uh, the whole picture of, of being one. Somehow or other, how did it go in the Course in Miracles? It says someone must have thought the idea what it would be like to be separate so that I can experience myself as a separate being instead of the whole being pure awareness. Now, at this point, Science says that there was a big bang. Well, no, it didn't happen. But they had to come up with a theory. So there were many theories how time began and consciousness came into being. But I also learned one other thing, but I, because I studied psychology when I was younger and I found out that the more I found truth, the less I felt that the psychology knew the truth. But then again, psychology never delved into the spirit world, into spirit life. So uh, the point I'm trying to make here is that um, a consciousness came into being at the time of great change. And that that uh, this this great this this consciousness, okay. I'm trying to put words into something that I find hard to do. This consciousness that people revere as everything in life, it really isn't, because consciousness still lives in time and space. But in truth, we don't live in time and space as spirit only as bodies. And when we live in time and space, of course, we work, we're, we we live with uh, all kinds of limitations and setbacks. And the first thing we do when we live in this uh, separation sense of being, that we begin to judge each other. We begin to come up with uh, many ways of, uh, what does, uh, um, help me here. Of feeling separate? Yeah, feeling separate, yeah. In day-to-day -day life? Right. There, there's so many, uh, Krishnamurti, not Krishnamurti, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I have a quote from Krishnamurti regarding the separation. Is That's right, yeah, it? sure, yes. Yeah. When you call yourself an Indian or a Muslim or a Christian or a European or anything else, you are being violent. 
Do you see why it is violent? Because you are separating yourself from the rest of mankind. When you separate yourself by belief, by nationality, by tradition, it breeds violence. So a man who is seeking to understand violence does not belong to any country, to any religion, to any political party or partial system. He is concerned with the total understanding of mankind. Those are powerful words of Krishnamurti, and it's so true. Why? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that's Peter. <laughs> oh, that's Peter. <laughs> From Australia. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. War is over. Right. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. Well, this Very helps important. us to... This helps us to understand why we have wars and we have uh, we are now in the fifth dimension. So we're beginning to understand things we never understood before. Um, lately, a book was written by uh, uh, Mark Gober. Mark Gober, right. <laughs> Called the Up Upside Down. He wrote two books. Upside Down Thinking was, I think, his first one. Yes, that's I that's right. Yeah, yeah. And he proved how even our psychology is really upside down, okay, the, the way we look at life. And the, the, the fact is that um, <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's upside down. I'm finding it hard to find, find the words to continue. But anyway, um, yeah, the basic premise of his book is that the world thinks consciousness arises through a brain in a body and that each body is a separate entity and everything else is out there. What he discovered was, which of course he didn't discover it because it's yeah. in all the spiritual literature, is that what's really going on, but again, this is just one step towards true awareness. All of a sudden we realize, okay, everything I see, everything I know, everything I've heard, everything I've read, everything that's ever occurred, everything anybody said to me, all science, all biology, all physics, the world, the universe, photos from the Hubble, they all occur in my consciousness. So he came to realize that consciousness was primary, meaning it's, it's, it's primary to the body, but it's still not the final total awareness. That's right, yeah. <clears throat> well, he was right in many ways, but the truth is that we have never had a beginning. You see, so the fact that we lived in pure awareness was never discovered until recently. So there was a time when we all lived, we were never born. Wow. And we shall never die because death has nothing to do with reality. In reality, we live in time and space that the reality of us, of who we are, and this is the whole point of this talk that we're giving here, is that we are not who we think we are at all. We are spirit and the spirit is endless. In fact, it is, um, the word is... Um, eternal? Yes, eternal. Emptiness? It, it, emptiness, right. The very nature of being is emptiness. Emptiness means no thought. So you live in pure awareness, but the pure awareness is, is, uh, is manifold because it's like heaven itself. Okay, it is actually heaven itself. You are totally aware of everything but there is no negativity. There is no limitation. There is no feeling bad, you see? But through the body, because consciousness wanted to experience itself, then consciousness came into being and that very being of consciousness now makes us feel limited. In fact, most people do not even realize that they are immortal. That the, that the true spirit is the spirit itself, in other words. Now, what I would like to discuss here is how we separate ourselves and how we can learn to get back to the knowing of who we are. First of all, when we think we are the body, we judge other people. 
for example, maybe a different class of people, maybe a different thinking people. So when we judge another person, we are judging ourselves. When we create any limitation outside of us, it is the limitation in us that we are seeing. However you feel about what you think is happening is really happening within you. And that is the biggest lesson that is to be learned. That once we begin to see the oneness of it all, that when you look at another human being, you're really seeing yourself. Ah, uh, no, that's quite a big step. And that goes beyond philosophy, psychology, or any form of study, because it only comes from the realization of who you are. Now, when we talk about the realization of who you are, um, I've read at one point where we have to go through to five stages. Um, could you, I will write it down, mm -hmm. yeah. Would you like me to read them? Yeah, could you okay. please? Yeah, because I, I, I'm blind. Okay, so truth is first to be but said. Right, so we said it, right? We don't believe it. I'm not a body. Maybe that's the first thing we okay. say. And then it's to be repeated many times. And then to be accepted as partly true with many reservations. Like for instance, I dream at night, I see things, I'm not a body then. So maybe I'm thinking, yeah, maybe I'm not a body. And then um, next to be considered seriously more and more, and then finally accepted as true. For, right. exa for that truth, for example. Right, yeah. And that applies to, to all truth. No, because many people ask, well, how do I realize what you're saying is the truth? How do I come to know it? Well, you don't come to know it just by hearing it alone, but by exploration of your true state. And by doing that, you go through those stages until finally something says in you, you have the knowledge. And that knowledge will always be there. Sometimes it is referred to as the heart. Well, the heart already knows the truth because in spirit you are already the truth. So when you experience out of body, then you begin to see things you never saw before because you begin to see the truth as it actually is. Uh, okay, let's go into some points of how we separate ourselves. Well, I like the example you gave of judgment. Judgment immediately creates a yeah. sense of defense. And separation. When we judge anything at all, right, mm -hmm. right, right. We are cre creating the very limitation that we have imposed on us. See, so the limitation that we see is the limitation that we think is real. And the more, the deeper we see, the deeper we expand into our knowing until that knowing becomes the resident in the heart, in other words, okay? We, we say that the heart knows the truth. In, in the case where you were talking about consciousness versus pure awareness, uh, what exactly is the difference between the two? Well, first of all, pure awareness doesn't have time and space, okay? Whereas consciousness does. Consciousness also goes through many different levels of seeing and experiencing. So there are gradation points. Pure awareness is. Now, the, the, the thing that is so beautiful, um, one time an explanation was supposed to, to come about uh, whether God exists. And they were debating but one time a man said, the best way to explain God is to say that God is. It does not belong to a religion. God is the very light itself that appears when we are outside of the body. So in brief, God is the totality of all of us together. All of us put together is God. And when you begin to see this in one another, and this is why it's so important to start understanding each other, because when you begin to see that we are all interrelated, interdependent, 
you also see that everything that you think outside of you is really inside you. So what you see in another, you're seeing in yourself. When you begin to see this kinship with everyone you meet, every, every time that you meet a person and you see him in you, you are beginning to see God. So you cannot say uh, uh, an atheist is an impossibility because God is the very reality of all of us as one. And when we begin to see that oneness everywhere, which is the highest truth. See, today when I started out to talk, I said, oh, we're going to talk about the highest truth, the greatest that there is. And immediately I was overawed by the whole thing because something said to me, but Bert, do you know the whole truth completely? And so I was a little bit of reluctant to go deeper into it flowingly. But now, as I talk to you, I find as if something is telling me, yes, Bert, you're telling the truth. You are, you are the, the truth. And everybody that you are now looking at is also the truth. But are you the body? No, the body is in front of you. Did you know that? The body is not you. You are the spirit. Okay, so help me here. Uh, yeah, I have a question about, yeah. um, about the topics non-duality and there's a lot of confusion right. with a lot of different writings and stories and ideas out there at Vita and, and about exactly what non-duality is in Ramana Maharshi. And there's, it seems as though if, if we think we're a person in the world, that's definitely not non-duality, that's duality. That's, that's duality. That's yeah. duality. Because duality right. means that you can only relate when you have an opposite to relate to. For example, you look in the mirror and you see yourself, that's a duality. You talk to another person, that's a duality. A duality means that you need something to relate to. Mm -hmm. There's a relationship. In pure awareness, there's no relationship, that's just pure awareness. But then we cannot, we cannot fathom it because the mind can't even begin to conceive a state where pure awareness can exist by itself. But not only it can, but it is who we are. So Gary Renard introduced the idea of non-duality and pure non-duality. And the suggestion sounded like when you recognize that you're not the body, you suddenly you realize it's obviously, it's more obvious that this is occurring in my consciousness and what I am is not a body, I'm formless, awareness or whatever outside, I'm not really here. This is a dream or it's a play going on of which I'm witness to. A lot of people think that in itself is the final resting place of non-duality to get to that level where you know that with certainty. But even though you don't exist as an entity and you're not actually a, a player in the play, it's still sort of a duality because there's still you, the formless consciousness right. and what seems uh -huh. to be playing out in front of you. So yeah. what is this ultimate that you talked about at the beginning? What what? So, I don't so, really know what the the, uh, the 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 wholeness is, but I know that I experienced near death twice in my life, and twice I was in that pure state of being. But in that pure state of being, was there Bert? A part of me wants to say yes, Bert was there because I experienced, but. Everything that was ex being being experienced was a part of me. It was a totality. And so who was it that was experiencing except the totality experiencing itself? So when you are one, which you are because we're all one, yet when you're experiencing, it is the whole experiencing as you. See, and that's the, that's the beautiful growth that we come to understand. I'm not saying that I fully understand it because I still think sometimes that there is Bert here. Although I've realized that, that I'm not the body. But, but what I'm trying to say here is that if we go deep into that knowing of the heart, what would it be like to be who I truly am beyond my name, beyond my 
passed beyond the body. I still know that I am experiencing because pure experience, experiencing itself too, as, as pure, does that, that make sense to you? That makes sense. Where, where does love come into play? Love is all there is. As a matter of fact, all I ever talked about right now is really love, you know? Um, love is the only truth there is. Love is not an emotion. And this is why when I wrote the book, The Four Unknown Facts of Reality, the first thing that I received, and I received it uh, internally, is that do not put the word God, because people make it into religion. So don't, don't say that the, that the first item is love, because then people think of love as what they feel love is, and they make it into an emotion, okay? But love is not an emotion. Love is the pure state of being itself. When I am being without thought, when I am being, I am part of everything that I see and know. I am part of everything at that moment. When I come to, you know, when I, when I go into meditation, everything is so clear. And then now when I come to put words to it, I'm a dumb bunny. Um, help me here. Yeah, well, I, I have a question. When you talked about your NDE that you had in 2007, you just you touched upon the oneness and you said there was a light. Was that comparable to what you're talking about here? That yes. Transcends well, the, the light came. The light came later when I experienced every person in the room, doctors, nurses, the patients. I saw everyone. Not only I saw their individuality, but I also saw their, their, their complete oneness with me. Because at that point, there was no one to judge good or bad, right or wrong, should or shouldn't. There was only what is, and what is was part of what is happening. And then I couldn't tell exactly, was it burnt that was experiencing after, after I came back into the so body. You, you, so you went so, from a state of total awareness and then suddenly perception arose again? Well, total perception did not arise. Then, then I felt that I was pulled into the light. I know, but after the light. And, and when, when, well, let me explain the okay. light just for a bit. Okay. okay. When I explain, because we're talking about love too. Mm -hmm. When I went into the light, I felt incredible love. I, I have a mother, <laughs> which is an incredible woman, and she's pure love herself. And um, <clears throat> when I was brought up in the war, and I remember in the war itself, the, the bombs were falling, everything was being blown away. My mother came and she put her hand on my shoulders and the shoulders of my sister, we were there. And she said, today it looks like we won't be alive. This was 19, the very beginning of the war, 1939, 39. right. I was six years old. And, um, and the, the one thing that when she held us close, she said, well, if we're, we're going to be blown up today, but there's one good thing, we'll be together. We'll always be together. Well, the moment, I heard her say that all fear went away because I thought if I'm going to be with my mother all the time and with my sister, which I love, you know, and there were the only two of them present at the time of the bombing, <clears throat> I felt, oh, this would be heaven. <laughs> so there was no fear there. And since then I was never afraid of death. So there was um, a knowing there that when love is present, fear cannot be present. The, the presence of love is the total annihilation of fear. So is fear wrong? In consciousness, we experience a lot of fear, but fear is not wrong. Fear is the greatest lesson given to us as human beings to learn love. Because by facing the fear, we begin to see that all we are is really afraid to die. 
afraid to, to disappear because we don't understand it. We really think we are the body. Something's going to happen to us. Nothing can happen. Nothing can happen. But only when you know that, that truth, because you love love, you're in love with love, so to speak. Love is all that there is. Love is the oneness. In fact, we, that's what we call God. God is love. And the moment that love is total, fear cannot exist. When fear does not exist, then you begin to rise in your knowledge, your knowing of the totality of life. Uh, does that answer your point? It answers it. Um, I have another question. I'm trying to figure out how to put it into words. So the ultimate reality is this pure awareness, this emptiness, this God state, this state of love where there's no perception and no consciousness. Yeah. And according to myths or stories, there is awareness. Right. There's awareness. Okay, because sometimes it, it, it's confused awareness mm -hmm. and consciousness. Mm -hmm. Awareness is the primary one. Awareness is eternal. Awareness has no birth, no death, nothing. Awareness is always there. Even in your deepest sleep, without sometimes we think, oh, but I'm not aware then. Oh, yes, you are aware, still aware. Yeah, because when you get up, even five minutes later to go to the bathroom, for example, you say, oh, I had such an incredible sleep. I felt so good. I was told this. So even in deep sleep, you're still aware. You're always aware permanently. There was never a time when you were not aware. In fact, awareness is the a very true nature. Anything else is just um, an addition to understand pure awareness. So consciousness is derived from the idea of awareness, but it itself is ego. Consciousness is ego because it has no time and space and it thinks in separation. And the moment you think in separation, then you're dividing the very thing that is indivisible. You see, there's no okay. individual, yeah. So in, in, in the case you had your experience, this, this one experience of oneness with an NDE following an illness, did you have, have you ever had any similar or close feelings like that prior to that or experiences? Well, the only one that I've had is that during the war, I was not afraid to die. But it only happened when my mother put her hand on my shoulder and the, and the shoulder of my sister. And she said, she said, here we are. This could be the end. But do not worry, because we'll always be together. Mm -hmm. And somehow or other, that fact that we will be always together meant that we are love. And in that love, we'll not die. So at that moment so, you didn't feel separation that, that, that's that's exactly it so you, it, you it mimicked the true truth of heaven in that moment that's right yeah yeah and in that moment we we mm -hmm. suddenly had an inkling of oh wow we are great in this love we are i am complete so you had and, your first taste of it way back then that's right that's right now and that stayed with me until uh then I went into sports and bodybuilding and everything else. And, but then, uh, and then in 1973, I experienced Bhagavan Ramana Maharshi because I prayed. I said, you know, is this is all life is? When I came to Toronto, I worked uh, as a physiotherapist. And, um, <clears throat> but I wasn't happy there because I was made to do a lot of selling job rather than just doing treatments. And I wanted to do more than that. But anyway, to make a long story short, I was very depressed. And in my depression, I prayed that next day going to work, as I was going out the, the house, I see an old face in front of me. And I never forget the eyes. And was this a, a spirit? Like, was it an apparition, like spirit, or it was not an apparition? No, it's a, it's a solid form. So although I couldn't see from the. Was it just the done. face, or you saw the whole? Body? I saw mostly the face, but then again, he had no clothes on. Okay, and this just you appeared know? to you as and you were going out the door. That's right. That's Did you right. have any idea of what I, it was? There's or? no words uttered, but the love that was shown in his eyes, I would never forget, never. Did you know who he was at the time? No, I had no idea. I, I had no idea of yoga or Hindus or uh, enlightened people. I had no idea at all. 
But what had happened is that one day I was on a date walking along, this was in Toronto, walking along, um, beg your pardon, my memory is not good. Um, it's uh, Yorkville. Yorkville, right, <laughs> Yorkville. And there were a lot of hippies there and they had a new store called the, uh, the, the, uh, the bookseller. And they had a new book down there. And I was very curious because I always loved books. And so I said to her, I said, let's go down and explore. This How long room. after the, this uh, apparition? Two was, weeks. Two weeks. Okay, so two weeks, two weeks right. after you saw two this after the, apparition. In right. Your house. And then I saw the cover of a book with the, the picture of Bhagavan Ramana Maharshi in it, which, which is... He's here somewhere over that way. Over so, that way. Oh, <laughs> yeah. And, um, and then when I saw that, I grabbed the book in my hand and I started to cry, you know, which disturbed the date that I was with. But she didn't know what was happening. But I said, I can't explain it. I said, but this man appeared to me two weeks ago. And this is true. This is true. And the moment I said the word true, I, I became actually transformed. In fact, the next day I went over to my bus. And uh, this was on Bay Street. The, 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 12th floor, it was an incredibly gigantic uh, health, health store, uh, health uh, uh, exercise place. Uh, even, uh, what's his name, uh, was there with us, uh, that, that famous star, that-, that... Charlton Heston. Charlton Heston. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was, a, it was a health club, an elite health it club was a, you worked at. That's right, I worked as a physiotherapist, right? Yeah, but anyway, uh, so I went over to my boss the next day. I, I wasn't dressed in my usually attire, which I had to look all dressed, tie and suit, you know. And I was there in jeans and looking like a hippie. And I said to the boss, I said, I quit. He said, you can't quit. I said, you know, not only I need you, but I mean, what are you going to be doing, you know? But I couldn't explain. I saw the face of Ramana Maharshi appear to me two weeks ago. I couldn't say that. It would, he would think I'm crazy. And in those days, people were not very aware like they are now. So I, 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 I walked out so happy. And, um, but I thought, well, I'd better get a, a less expensive apartment. And I was on me and Avenue, this was in Toronto, and I found a basement apartment to an Italian home. But this basement apartment was huge. And, and I went down there and uh, I began to meditate his name and chant his name. And before I know it, uh, people started dropping by wanting, wanting me to talk about my experiences. And so yoga became popular in Toronto, as a matter of fact. I was one of the pioneers that brought it there. A woman who uh, was very much into it, and she wanted to take care of me and cook for me and clean because I, I wasn't much into those things. I, I, I lived very much alone when I found Ramana Maharshi, but she came there and um, she, uh, she said that you, the YMCA wants you to start teaching yoga. And she printed t-shirts with carding yoga. <laughs> and it took off like wildfire. I have a but, question about back to oneness and the seeming separation. When you saw Ramana's um, suddenly appear in front of you, was that something similar? Was that similar to feeling the sense of pure awareness or emptiness or oneness at that moment? Was that a glimpse of it? What, how would you what, describe What that? I can describe that is the love that he felt for me was something not even in my mother. I've never experienced. This is with Ramana Maharshi. Ramana period. Maharshi, right, okay. right. I never experienced someone so loving, so open, so, so clear, so divine looking. You see, it was absolutely mind boggling. And so when you saw him, it was like a reenactment of that oneness or home or heaven. Is that what it seemed like? When I see it, when I when saw you, When you saw Ramana. When, when you, I saw him in person. Right, when he, when he appeared. Because my question is. When I saw him in person, all I could remember after mm -hmm. were his eyes. His eyes were incredible. They, they, they went right through me. I've never saw eyes like that. 
and he had uh, he had a love that you can see that he was not human. And how long it did it last? One minute. One yeah. minute. And so well, the maybe reason, less, I'm, maybe reason yeah. I'm asking this is because if our true reality is this pure awareness, heaven, home, emptiness, and you had a glimpse of it, or you saw it in your NDE, and you had an experience of it with your mom during the war, and then you saw Ramana, in, the, in this ontological story of how the world seemed to happen, there was a thought, what's it like to be separate, and then consciousness came into being, and then then consciousness in fear created you know, a manifest universe to hide in. And so basically there was like a, an instantaneous idea about being separate. Did you, when you were drawn, were you drawn out of those um, moments, for instance, in your NDE back into separation? Was there something that triggered it? Did that brought you back that kept, that only allowed you to be there for a, a few instants? No, no, the, no. That, that, that memory kept repeating itself over and over again. As a matter of fact, when I stayed there alone after meeting him, I, all I wanted to do was chant his name and, uh, you know, it was an Indian name, uh, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was the chant that came and, and I used to chant it all day long and that's all I wanted to do. But then people nearby and there was a guy also uh, from the YMCA who was looking for some, some new classes to give. He saw me and uh, he said, you do yoga, you're familiar with yoga. And I said, yes, you know, and, and he wondered if I would start teaching some, some, like, you know, some classes. I don't know whether I answered your... You know, I, my, my real question is I was trying to see if it was reenacting the same moment of the original separation when you went from this one mistake back into your dualistic existence. At the moment, at the moment that I was with him, those few mm -hmm. seconds, there was no separation. At all. Okay, but then all of a sudden there was separation again. Was that something when, that? Well, that because when I when he disappeared and I went back to work because I was going to work at the mm -hmm. time it happened. Okay, I was, uh, yeah, I, I was uh, a little bit. What is the word? Um, confused. Yes, confused. Yeah. Did the yeah. apparition disappear as a result of a thought you had, or did no, it no, no, no? It, it disappeared. It came. So you didn't have a thought, oh, Bert's late for work, and then he disappeared or something? Not at all, no. not at all. As a matter of fact, after it happened, all I could think of was him. Then I went to work and I started talking about him. But when I started talking about him, um, some of the workmates started to make loud, they made, make fun of, of it, you know? Oh, you're having hallucinations. Uh, because I have to tell you something else. Uh, at that time, I was, I was very interested in psychology and I had studied psychology. So in psychology believes that the brain creates hallucinations. And uh, this is what is happening also with near-death studies, which I am very much interested in and I belong to. Uh, and they've discovered that 10, 10 million people have been actually brought back into life through medical discoveries of uh, resuscitation, you know, by bringing the heart back into life. And uh, <clears throat> uh, I keep losing my point. Okay, so um, well, back to the you had another NDE, but back mm -hmm. to the one you had in two thousand and seven. So you were in a sense of pure oneness at one point where there was just light. And then at some yes, point sir. you came back into being Bert again. Do you recall what triggered that? Or was that a thought that triggered it? Was there? No, the point is that when you live this life of mm -hmm. body, mm -hmm. you're so conditioned into it that even though you experience something fantastic and you begin mm -hmm. to believe that there is something more, but yet somehow you're still caught in this in this hypnotized mm -hmm. state of being. And I kept believing that for quite a while. But when I, when I retired into that apartment, basement apartment, and I started teaching yoga, and I started teaching his teachings, you know, because he, that he was very real to me, I was kind of back and forth, back and forth. Between yeah. like having an ego and being ego Yeah, free. right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I wasn't ego free. Um, 
I still don't feel I'm completely ego free, but it's a, it's quite a, a long road to now and seeing and studying the, there have been about 10 million people, or did I just say that? Who have had NDEs. Who have NDEs, right, NDEs. recorded NDEs, yeah. And it's in the annals, it's in the, it's in the books, right, because I, I belong to, to IANS, the International Association of Near-Death Studies. And the reason I'm so interested in that is because when a person, uh, when a person dies, they don't die at all. There's no such thing as death. So if, if let's say you're in a car and you're going to get an, into an accident and you're aware, you see the, the oncoming car, you're going into the collision. Before the collision itself, you're already outside the body. Okay, it's just like divine grace. So people don't experience the actual pain of being crushed to death when they're brought back. What they experience is a boop, all of a sudden I was outside the body experiencing what happened. And uh, this is what, what is happening all the time, that we are actually being protected the moment we begin to understand that we are more than a body. And so you live in that protection all the time. You know, you live in that uh, saving grace. Mm -hmm. Like if there's one thing I can say about myself is that I might not have to overcome my ego, but I am very much at peace. I'm very happy. You know, I'm extremely happy. You know that, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so, um, and the reason I say I'm happy is because, again, the, the, the state of being is happiness itself. It is love itself. And it's not something you acquire, it's something that awakens when you know the truth of your being. Now, I've studied psychology and psychology gives you many techniques of how to overcome fear and start feeling good. But it, it only lasts as long as you're doing the technique. But when you start realizing the truth, you go to the fifth point and finally you access Accept it as the truth. So we, as the truth. when you describe okay. your mystical experiences that you've had in, or in the process of awakening, you can sometimes go back and forth between these, these levels of understanding and get caught. For instance, you can get caught in duality, even though you may have been fully aware for quite a while that you're the consciousness in which everything But the, the memory right. comes back again. So you go back fast. and forth. You're back and forth. But the moment there is danger, anything happening, anything that's threatening, immediately you become aware of who you are. You know, that, that kind of, it's, it's always there, really, you know. But it's easy to get caught in the world when you're working everyday life because, again, you become part of that machinery, you see. Yeah. And thank you for asking me these questions because uh, when I start talking about myself or what happened, I get lost. My, my memory of your past is getting fainter and fainter. Yeah. Maybe this is a good uh, point also to open it up a little bit and perhaps the, the questions or comments. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay, are there any so questions? If you're interested, if you'd like to make a comment or ask a question, please. Uh, one option is to raise your virtual hand and then we'll take the questions in sequence. So, this, this virtual hand is usually at the bottom of the screen. There's a hand there. But I, I can you, see that you can, you mm -hmm. can raise it that way. Or you can, you can just uh, wait until somebody's finished uh, and then uh, unmute yourself and, uh, and, and ask a question. Okay, I, there's Miriam who has a question. So go ahead, Miriam, unmute yourself, please. Where's Miriam? I'm going to put her on speaker view, honey, so you'll see her. I'm here. Yeah. One second. There she hi, is. can you see me? Oh, can hi, you hear me? hi. Yeah. Uh, faintly, but I can hear you. <laughs> hi. Um, hi, I came in a bit late. For some reason, I thought it started at 4.30, so I apologize for that. I hope I'll time it starts tomorrow, but that's not my question for you. Um, so you were talking about, we are not the body, which that's I right. understand. Um, and you said something about we're behind the body. 
I no, always the, thought the body is in myself front. as being in the body. The, the body is in front. Yeah. Yeah, right. Because we, the, the spirit, it, it, right now I'm talking to you, I'm referring to you, I'm, I'm experiencing you, but it is the spirit that's doing all that. What we think is the body. And, and you see, and when you go into the spirit world, of course, there's no time or space. It's a different, different uh, view and experience. But you'll find that everything that you've ever experienced in the body was experienced by the spirit. Did you, when you said the body's in front of you, did you mean that within the consciousness, the conscious experience of the scene the first, play, this body's in the front? Uh, the, the, it's in see. front because the moment you look into the mirror, you see the body. But it's still not you. But it's not you. But it's, no. you always, it's always the right. first you, you are thing. Wearing, you are yeah. wearing this form. Right. In the consciousness dream. Right. And that's why we <laughs> suffer. We suffer old age and we suffer fear of death and, mm -hmm. and we suffer all different things because we think we are so limited. But in truth, we are not. And and so when we begin to see that our came mind, to my mind when was that? Yes? No, you carry on. Yeah. I want to hear what you no, said. When, when, I, what when came to my mind to... when you said that. When I said what? <laughs> <laughs> About we're behind when you look in the mirror, you see the body in front of you. Um, and you're behind. It, it, what came to my mind is when I was a little girl and we would do these cutouts of this body and then you would put a different outfit on it <laughs> and you would put this outfit on this body and fold it around then you take it off and put another out so that's kind of like what you're oh, saying the consciousness cute. does yeah. as we go from life to life mm -hmm. yeah 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 well it, it's i don't know if that's what you're saying but that's what uh, i'm hearing. no that's not what I, I, I said but the the body in front is because this is all you see when you look into the mirror or, or yeah. whatever, you, this is what you see. This is in front of you, but but you you are more or less well. You're not really inside, but you're all you're you're just the pure awareness of everything you're experiencing. But because the body is taking his over, body sense, the body takes over and interprets everything according to its conditioning. And because in the terms of the condition, you believe that that to be true. You see, and this is what is happening all the time, but it's not true. What is true is that you are this eternal, magnificent being that is, that is perfect, never begun and will never end. And it is, it is hard for the average human being to actually believe that. So it requires quite a bit of patient seeking and understanding. And you start by seeing this, that how you react to people is how you react to yourself. Okay, when you begin to understand that dynamic, then you see how you're telling yourself all the time, how limited you are. You see, did you know that 80% um, of the population suffer guilt? And, uh, and we can call it a, a feeling of, I'm, I don't feel, feel complete. I feel something is lacking. I'm not completely happy. There's got to be more. See, that feeling is almost in everyone. And that feeling is, the Course in Miracles calls it guilt. A feeling as if you've done something wrong or you're wrong. And so, but because if you don't deal with that and, and forgive it, if you don't forgive that feeling, okay, you don't love yourself enough to continue exploring who you really are, which is so beautiful. So you begin to identify all the time with, with that feeling that you've had. And the moment you don't excuse it, the moment you, for, the moment you forgive it, it keeps on increasing in its intensity until there come a time when you begin to believe it is so real that you're convinced that you are this person. But there's no such thing as a bad person, really. It's all conditioned into us through environment. But when it happens in environment, we think it's real. Instead of we having drawn, drawn it to us through our belief and belief system, the way we look at things. When I was in the war, I was brought up in the war, and I was uh, 
six years old when the war broke out. And, and I saw people, you know, I mean, oh my God, being blown away, my own neighbors. I was in Malta at the time, a British Dominion. And uh, I, I said, this, this is life, this is living. You know, my mother was great. She was a, a great soul. But anyway, um, I began to believe that this is the way we live. This is, this is totality. And, and so um, I became very, um, naughty <laughs> uh, and as a teenager very confused but soon um, I had an experience that kind of changed my life I, I had three out-of-body experiences in my life one of them was when I was 17 and it happened during a great storm and I fell about 20 feet down into the into the bottom, which was full of rocks and heavy waves and storm. Anyway, um, and at that point, I was out of the body and experienced, my God, I was brought up to believe that I am sinful. I was brought up that I go to hell. Uh, I was brought up a Catholic, you know, and I believed all that. And I was a very unhappy young man. But when I experienced myself as I really was in that pure being state, uh, <clears throat> then I thought, oh, I, I need to find a teacher. And that's when I began to think of coming to Canada or going overseas in order to learn more because I thought I didn't know anything. But anyway, the, the point I'm trying to make is that we are the product of what we keep believing to be real, you see? But when we go into it and ask, mm -hmm. is it real? You see, and we find that our true nature is all love, 100% unconditional love. And when you discover that, you know, right now at my age, I'm 88, you know, but I'm very happy even though I'm blind and my memory is gone, but I'm the happiest person alive, really, because this memory, this knowing that you are love never leaves you. And that's what's really important. That's all the healing you need. That's all the happiness you need. That's all that makes everything perfect and right, right? <laughs> yeah. So I don't know whether I answered your question or not, but okay. Oh, oh it was a really simple question. I mean, I, I struggle with this you are not your body. I know I'm not my body, but I, I experience it as if I'm inside the body. You know, the body sensations press on me as if I'm inside it. It's just That's curious right. about the That's being behind the body. Very good. Yeah. No, no. You, 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 yeah. you are, the, when I say the body is in front, it, what I mean is, is what you're saying. I feel I am inside the body. That's what I mean. So the body is in front of me, you know, I'm surrounded by it, but I am inside, oh. inside the body. Oh, okay. I'm okay. saying the same thing you're oh, okay. saying, right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So Kieran has a question. Go ahead, Kieran. Um, or comment. Thank you, first of all, for being here with us tonight. My question, so I'm wondering in your experience, in this experience, in your experience. Which one experience are you referring to? I, All of them, I guess, eh? Okay. Your, is your experience, huh. are you uh, um, experiencing oneness? Is that, is that your experience or or do you see my experience of oneness? Is there I still, subject? I still see bodies. I still people having bodies and separate from me in the sense that there's a distance between us as far as physicality is concerned. But at the same time, I can't help loving you. See what I mean? So you you you, you feel this love so strong because you know that everything everyone you talk to is yourself in another in another form. So this is, this is what is lacking in the world, that we don't know the truth. Psychology is not enough. Philosophy is not enough. Religion is not enough. But we need to explore who we are. 
and there are ways to explore because there are many enlightened, well, awakened people nowadays and they can help us. And when you get to know who you really are, you'll find that the part of you that you get to know is also in everyone else. So we are very much uh, alike beyond the skin, beyond the nationality, beyond the age, beyond male and female, we are exactly the same. And when you begin to see that completely, you can't help loving other people. But the beautiful thing is when you can't help loving other people, you are also loving yourself. And, and so your life will be smooth, things will begin to happen to you. For example, I come to the point where there were times when I was completely penniless. Well, I, I was very short of money, okay? But I, I believe very strongly that life will take care of me. And it always did, always did, abundantly. So we, do, we, do, we always have worries because we think we're, we're living in a world. We're not really living in a world, really. This, this world is just a dream and appearance. The real life is the life that we live in our heart, you know, and that heart is love. And, and when you begin to feel this love, the love of your husband, your children, neighbors, or, you know, it will start coming to you. You feel so alive and feel so good. And with that, we'll start coming a lot of answers because the only thing that blocks us from knowing the truth is fear. But when that fear drops away, mm -hmm. what is left is love. And when love is the only thing that's left, that's how things open up. I don't know whether I've answered my, your question. Thank oh. you, that was very beautiful, thank you. Oh, thank you, thank you for that. Thank you for questioning. Hmm. Any other comments, questions? I guess not. Well, I have one. Okay. Just the answer you just gave was beautiful. So it's not that we discover this oneness in isolation. We actually discover this oneness along with our brother and, and oh, yeah. the seeming separated world becomes more like to heaven. It's not that we yeah. boom, we're in the light and that's all of existence and it's over. It's more like our heart expands. We feel more love, more that's connection right. Seem in the seeming separated world. And it becomes. Yeah, but it's not separated anymore not because anymore. It's, it's a family type it's of thing. Definitely. You know, the, the closest thing we, we can say, we're just a family. We're, we're very close to each other because we see the similarity. You don't get easily offended. You don't get uh, get protective. Mm -hmm. You see, because you don't feel that separation. You know, in a case where just I, like you and right, I, the way we right. feel, we, we live every day, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's the same way. Yeah, that love is always there. Yeah. So, in the case where some people seem to have transcended the mind, where they now recognize that they're the mind that's outside of everything, and they that they seem to be established in that, or they think they're, the, or at least they appear as though they're now recognize the fact that they're this consciousness or they're the mind in which this is all occurring. And they're outside of the whole dream. They're no longer, they no longer see themselves as the body, but simply the body is one amongst many bodies that seems to be in the dream. But sometimes there seems to be like a coldness or a callousness to that. And that's because they haven't realized the heart. That's right. Okay. That's right. Mm -hmm. When you don't realize your heart mm -hmm. is the very love itself you yearn for, then you feel hungry for it. That hunger becomes fear, defense, becomes aggression, becomes uh, almost hatred of other people that have it and because you don't. You feel separation, in other words. Mm -hmm. Like you use the word separation all the time, and that's mm -hmm. perfect, perfect example of that. Yeah. And when you feel separate, you're lonely. And loneliness is, a, is an incredible mm -hmm. suffering type of uh, feeling. But, but that suffering only exists because you think you're not, you're not one with everything. Do you yeah. think you're separate? Yeah, because you think you're separate, yeah. And so the, the healing yeah. of the separation isn't about having 
a whole pile of mystical experiences, although you might have amazing mystical experiences. It's more about the loving kindness you start to feel and the warmth you feel for one another. And to experience yourself mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. being the very thing you want most. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, 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 when, when, when I hear the word God, the one thing I hear is love. Perfect, unconditional love. Hmm. Um, so are, are we are we through here or, or what or did, are there any questions? Um, uh, Deborah that she sent uh, on the chat line um, regarding the four unknown you have written about. The four unknown facts of Could reality. You go into the yeah, you want me to go into it? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. I don't know if you want to go into that or, or maybe maybe go into that tomorrow. I'm not okay, sure. Okay, we can go into it tomorrow then. All right, because it, it will take quite a bit of time to explain it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was but, my feeling. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that book was really quite a, quite a thing because... Uh, yeah, the way it was written, um, it was all written in one week, but but it it came as a as a as an inner knowing, a voice, you know, and and I didn't want to lose that voice, so I didn't go out, I didn't answer the phone, I didn't eat, I didn't sleep, I didn't do anything just not to lose it. Uh, but it was written in about. Um, seven, eight days. It's a fascinating book. The, the one thing I love about it is that it answers every question you can ever raise. And then I found out that it's very similar to Course in Miracles. As a matter of fact, there was a guy teaching the course and he said, Bert, I bought the book. And he said for the first time, it made it so clear and easy to understand. And I said, and brought tears to my eyes because I didn't know then that I that this book was so as beautiful as as it was. Now I cherish it. I loved I love the book. And uh, maybe so. Perhaps we can tackle that tomorrow. Sure. Okay. In the meantime, uh, Pete has Peter has a question. Comment. Who's Peter? Uh, hello. Burton Sue. Hi, hi. Hello, hi. This is Peter. Calling to you from the here in Australia. And I'll let you know everything is beautiful. The sky is lovely. So, wow. Susie, thank you for us. Many of us have so elegantly. And Bert, thank you for answering them. Really, so much, so much information and wisdom. So, thank you. Thank you, Bert. Well, thank, thank you. My question is specific. Your question thank is? Thank you. Yeah. My oh. question is specific. You mentioned, Bert, about consciousness that we experience that fear. Uh, sorry, fear is not wrong. It is this. And we experience that in consciousness. And you also mentioned, mentioned awareness is that eternal no birth, no death place. I wonder That's then right. if yeah. consciousness is a place, if consciousness is a place for us to learn from, to experience, then how do we uh, consciousness to work for us, not against us? Is Very that good. Excellent. In, Excellent. Uh, right. As a matter of fact, a fear is not something that you avoid or run away from, but to use it, because fear is always pointing to I want love, you see? Just like when you're unhappy. What is it that you want when you're unhappy? To be happy, you see? So fear is aching for love, but it doesn't think it's worth it. It doesn't think it knows it, and it thinks there's something wrong with it. But if you understand fear, you really look at it, what it is that you are fearing, that itself will help you back to know what and who you are. And what you're after is always love. But love, you already are. Love, you always. So it's a matter of discovering it even through fear. So avoid nothing. 
nothing that happens to you is really bad. We just make it bad. Nothing is bad, really. But all it is is a need, a need for what we think we lack. But we don't lack anything. But as long as you think you lack, then let it teach you something. What is it that I'm afraid of? And why am I afraid of it? And then as you look at it, really look at it, really study it, it will lead you automatically, because life is intelligent, it will lead you automatically to what you need to learn. You know, and, and that's how we grow. So use anything that is fearful, use anything that is negative, and don't see it as something wrong. See it as a lesson I need to learn. Yeah. And the moment you do that, everything, everything is changes. You see? Bert, thank you. If I may ask one last question in a practical sense, come aware that your mind is spiraling. So you, is that the moment when awareness is throwing light onto consciousness? You're I'm sorry, I didn't hear, I didn't hear what you. Something. How is my mind doing what? No, not do I didn't understand. When you become aware. Aware. Again. So when you become aware that your thoughts are spiraling in a negative sense, is that your awareness throwing light on this? Awareness is always trying to help you. It's always trying to make you learn. But sometimes we don't want to learn. Because we say, we say, I deserve to feel bad. I deserve because I did the wrong thing and I'm being punished. So we keep interpreting the, the wrong way. But if you see it as a lesson to be learned, wow, now you're, you're, uh, it's tremendous. See, everything that is happening that is, quote, not good is to teach you what is good. You see? And, and so uh, that's how we learn, yeah. You don't learn by denying yourself or fighting yourself or resisting yourself, but saying that whatever is happening, you excuse it, forgive yourself and say, now give me the lesson that I'm trying to learn. And somehow or other, it will start to come in ways you never expected, you know? It comes at night in a dream, it could come during conversation, it could come while walking, you know? It, come, it will come from everywhere. Sometimes somebody makes a statement and says, wow, that's it, that's what I was looking for, you know? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Such beautiful people, eh? I have a question about, about what Peter just commented on about the mind spiraling out of control and whether that's awareness trying to get your attention. I think it, it is it, those thoughts, what happens is, is awareness is coming, it's already there, it's not actually coming to you, it's your natural state. So it's like these thoughts are creating a barrier of some sort in a way. So these, so it's almost as though we have to identify the barriers to realizing what's really, what the real truth is. In a sense. That's right, yes. So it's just another tactic, perhaps an ego tactic to throw us, to, to say to us, hey, you're not in the light. You're not awakened. Yeah, exactly. You're not oneness. That's you're, right. That's you're right. this, you're yeah. that. This yeah. You have to fix yeah. this. Now, if you, be, if you start yeah. believing the ego, mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. then, then you start to suffer and go downhill. But if you meet it head on with a challenge and you say, no, I, I you know, there's, there's need for me to learn. But what, what always remember one thing, what you need to learn is always love. Always, 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 always. There's no other lesson but love. And love will teach you everything that you want and need to learn. But put love first. If, I, if you are not feeling love, you cannot learn anything, nothing at all. And because if love is missing, then hate and resentment will start to take its place. Revenge and stuff like that. And that's, that's when you go sort of downhill. But other than that, everything is a lesson to be learned. And we are here to learn that. Hmm. Okay. Hun. I have one more question. Well, you mentioned about this discomfort. So that discomfort in a way is, is a call for love or yes. because love is the natural state. That's right. That. That's right. The discomfort is a need for love. 
Because why do we discover it? Because you want to be comfortable, right? I mean, if you're not covered properly at night and you're feeling cold, well, then what, what do you need to do is cover yourself. Right? I just thought of something yeah. beautiful <laughs> in the Bible and in, I think maybe in the Course as well. I think maybe also in Islam and maybe also in Judaism, there's the idea of the comforter. So I just, I just. <laughs> That's beautiful. So it's the opposite of what you call the discomfort. Yeah, the comforter. Mm -hmm. The comforter is always mm -hmm. there mm -hmm. and it is your own heart. Yeah, your own heart really always knows the truth, though, if you become very still and listen to it. It's always there talking to you, guiding you. That's beautiful. Mm. Well, that's wonderful that... uh, Here you share your, your understanding of this non-dual um, understanding of how to of living in this world and um, Susie thank you so much for your questions the, your probing questions um, are very helpful thank you yeah. and um, maybe at this point we can draw the weeks uh, for today and yeah, uh, continue tomorrow uh, oh, yeah. okay so well, if you're getting there, unless there are any friends. Oh, we have one more question. Yeah, who is it? Rohit. Hi. Oh, oh Hi, yes. Bert. Thank you. Rohit, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so maybe not so much a question, but uh, a comment and just something to that I have been con. Uh, but what it, it's the why is that? Why is there? this charade, this game of trying to go through so many hurdles only to come to love, right? Why is there such um, suffering and misery and uh, like pain? <laughs> Why is it so complicated? Because we make why it, is this this game the mind this the mind always makes it complicated because it doesn't understand the very nature of what is happening and it fights it and the moment you fight something it fights you back the more you push the more it pushes against you the more you surrender the more you open yourself to its truth but you see we resist so much and it is resistance that causes all the chaos. There are some people that are so complicated that even if you give them a simple answer, they they still come up with that. It's okay, honey. It's okay? Yeah. yeah. Uh, even if you give them a simple answer, they cannot take it because they come up. But what if? What if there? And they come up with other reasons why it can't be done. So the, the mind is very complicated because it's been it, it's been brought up to to question everything, which is fine, but but somehow we don't know how to listen to what a simple simple a simple answer. Uh, people are always asking questions like the word "why." Well, here is one truth that I have learned throughout my life: is that "why" is a stupid question. You know, because it cannot be answered. Why cannot be answered, you know? Like, why is, a, uh, why is this happening? For example, you see a child born deformed, you know? It could be so many reasons, but we ask why. Now, that doesn't mean it's not a legitimate question, but we, we tend so much to ask why all the time that we're not listening to the answers that might be coming to us. So in other words, the mind is caught into questioning and is not looking at the answers that are already occurring. So this is where we have to be alert and love ourselves to know that what is good is for more powerful than what is not good. So the question why, in a sense, is actually keeping us from accepting the answer. Yes, because you always, the, the person, especially a very intellectual person who's always asking, they ask why this is happening, which is fine up to a point. 
But the moment you give them an answer, they come up with another why. Okay? And, and they keep on yeah. because they cannot look at what is obvious and simple. Why? Because we have lost that which is simple. I, I, I just remembered something. Ken Wapnick, who is a, a teacher of A Course in Miracles, used to say the same thing. That was the most common question people asked. And he said, it's as though you're a fireman and you're trying to carry somebody out of a burning building. And the person says to you, can you tell me why the building's on fire? And he says, the job is to get the heck out of the building, <laughs> not to stay in the burning building and ask why. <laughs> Yeah, get the person out of here. <laughs> yeah, well, that is... Yeah, I don't believe that. Really people. That. <laughs> yeah, people are always asking why. And after, after they hear the answer, they're not happy with the simple answer. They're so, the mind is so convoluted, so, so intellectual, that it wants to know why it, it happened in the first place. Like, you know, the, yeah. <laughs> no, that was good. But. Yeah, it's it, it's it, it's interesting because I, you know, I Carl Jung's answer to Job, um, which which was which I thought was an interesting perspective, the idea that awareness didn't have self reflection until you know, answer to Job by Carl Jung, the idea that Job. Um, suffered in, immensely and asked God, why am I suffering? Carl Jung was yeah. a, a visionary. And, and, and Carl a Jung said that we need consciousness in order to know the answer, to give us the answer. Is that what you're saying? No, what I'm saying is in his book, um, Carl Jung said that consciousness is it, 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 it's, so it itself did not have self-reflection, did right. not yeah. reflect yeah. until That's Job true. challenged, mm -hmm. challenged as, so, so, you know, so it's, it, and these are ideas, these are all thoughts. And right, this but is all the part point of, is, so why do we need reflection me, when we are living in perfection? Because pure awareness is the perfection of being. And it doesn't ask why, because the, the why does not enter. But I think for me, I have to ask, maybe to get to the point where you, where you yes, are. Yes, but now, yes, maybe, we, we do. Yeah, right. And, and I think for me, it's important to ask why, because it's one of the tools I have to see if what I have read and what I have heard is true. There are many tools, and one of them is to ask why. I think it's a legitimate question. It is up to a point, yeah. But you see, the, the, the word why is so hypnotic in our state of mind that the moment we ask it, we cannot even hear the answer. We are ready for the, with the next wife. Why? And we keep on going to the point where we drive ourselves crazy, never getting to an answer, going in circles. You see, so the, the word why is not wrong, but make sure that when you're asking why, you're ready to listen. Because, because even as you listen, you're not even listening. The mind is saying, but why? Why is that this way? Why should it be this way? You see? Do, do you understand what I mean? Why is, a, is like a disease. And even as, as it asks itself why, it is still not satisfied with what you are telling it and it's not listening to what you're saying because it's coming with another why you're saying what you're saying it keeps on going maybe i'll, I'll replace was that i'll replace the why with how <laughs> yeah so you can replace the why with a what instead of saying why am i suffering stop ask what is suffering ah now we can arrive at an answer mm -hmm. But if you ask why am I suffering, you'll never, you'll never get an answer. You'll have hundred thousand doctors telling you something different, psychology something, a different reason. The why is never satisfying, because the why is as a is a vicious circle of the ego mind. Okay, it's not wrong, but what happens is that the moment it is asking why, it is already not listening because it's already got another why it's happening in like that, as the person is saying. You see what I mean? 
they're not really looking. The why is not looking for a solution. It is looking for an answer to appease its own ego so that its intellect can say, yes, I'm right. The world is horrible, you see? But so ask what instead of why, and you'll arrive at a very logical answer that will begin to satisfy your heart, and then you begin to feel better for it. So if you if you happen to ask why all the time, then start asking what do I need to understand here? Are you still there? Yeah, he's still there. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, I'm listening. I'm yeah. listening. Yeah, yeah. So so this well, is uh, yeah. This is the important thing. Uh, start from now. The moment you're going to ask why, phrase it in a way that you can ask what it is. And then you'll find that the moment the answer starts to come, you begin to already feel like a release, almost like because you're listening now. When you find out what it is that you're asking, then the why becomes redundant because you get to the answer. And, and I, I have found this throughout the years that every time I ask why, I was never really satisfied. It always came with a patched answer, but it was never fully satisfying. Because when you ask what, now you begin to understand. So when a person asks, why am I suffering so much? You see, they don't want to know why they're really suffering. They want to know, why do this to me? Why, what's wrong with me, you see? But if you ask, what is suffering? Now we have a way of finding out and it can lead us to healing. It can lead us to an answer. Give it a try. So we, I, I just, okay, let's uh, give it a try. <laughs> and it will, I, I say it will usually take us into some kind of a conceptual, answer which will not really be satisfactory that's what yeah, I that's right yeah. yeah um so let's uh, end our session for now okay okay and, uh, mm -hmm. meet again tomorrow at uh, four o'clock okay mm -hmm. good good yeah, I apologize for my for my lack of memory in the beginning and losing my point, but I guess age is catch, catching up with me. So I apologize for that, but uh, I have a bright person here with me and she keeps me going. It's been wonderful to see the two of you together working so well together. Yes, thank and, you. Um, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. That and I want to continue. Yeah, I want to helpful. continue doing videos, but I, I, it needs to be a partnership at this point. Yeah, I think it works very well this format with uh, the two of you um, uh, participating in that in in this. Yeah. Way. So Thank thanks you. again, to thanks, everyone. Bob. Thank and you. I look forward to I'll see you tomorrow. tomorrow. Okay, see everybody tomorrow. It was nice to see everyone. Thank you, Bert. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. See you tomorrow. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Bert and Susie. Bye. 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 Oh, that's... That's our...